will by the word of Jehovah. His will by the will of the Lord. His will by divine right. His will calling us home. Well, last week we uh, talked about Abraham and the covenant, and this week Tom and I have come to a Bedouin tent. And forgive the rushing of flies and so on. This is this is how it is in the desert. This is how it was for Abraham and his uh, two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And that's what we've come to talk about. How about the next generation and what happened with Isaac and Ishmael? All in the service of learning uh, who are the Israelites, who are the Palestinians, where do they all come from? Tom? Where does it all begin? Well, Zola, as we saw last time, God gave the promise of the land to Abraham. Now it's uh, time for the next generation. And there is a next generation. The promised child was uh, also part of the promise to Abraham and that he would have a child through Sarah, his wife. But he was getting old and he kept talking about having a child and Sarah was still barren. And so finally, Sarah came, up, Sarah came up with the idea that, uh, well, let Hagar, my handmaid, have your child. And so uh, Her uh, Hagar became pregnant. And uh, after that happened, then uh, uh, Hagar and Sarah didn't get along very well. So Sarah dealt harshly with Hagar. And Hagar ran out into the desert, uh, pregnant with Abraham's child and she was going to run away. But the angel of the Lord said unto her, we read in Genesis 16, the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, behold, thou art with child and shall bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So as uh, the angel of the Lord instructed Hagar, she returned to Sarah and uh, waited out her term of pregnancy. And uh, Ishmael was born and was Abraham's firstborn son. But... Uh, as time progressed, the Lord fulfilled his promise that Abraham would have a child through Sarah. And Sarah, when she was very old, 90 years of age, became pregnant and uh, with the child of Abraham. She, she doubted, and, and Abraham doubted, that it would even come true when, when they understood the promise. Yeah, Abraham was 99 years old. Yeah. And uh, Sarah was 90, she was barren, she'd never had a child, and it looked like uh, she would never have a child. The lengths of lives were different. Abraham was not to die until he was 175, 175 according yes. to the biblical record. But he, but he was middle-aged and well into middle-aged, and Sarah was too, past her time. And to show the Lord's sense of humor, he instructed them to call their child Isaac, Yitzhak. Yitzhak, laughter. Laughter. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. He because loves they laughter. laughed when they... <laughs> and, and they laughed when uh, they heard the promise. But surely enough, uh, Isaac was born. Well, he went uh, through his very early infancy, and they had a weaning party in a, a tent like uh, we're in uh, today, Zola, uh, like this Bedouin tent that we are uh, sitting in now. And they had this great feast for the whole household of Abraham. And the child uh, Ishmael was uh, about 15 years old now. And he had been the son of Abraham now for all this time. And here was this new child. And he was jealous of Isaac. And he began to mock Isaac. 
And uh, that was more than Sarah could stand. And so she went to Abraham and said, oh, we can't take, uh, keep up with this. Uh, it's, it's too uh, much trouble. Uh, get rid of her mm -hmm. and her son because uh, she will not, and her son will not inherit with my son. Oh, well, this uh, really caused uh, Abraham a lot of trouble. Uh, but he went to the Lord and asked the Lord what to do. And the Lord said, hearken to your wife, Sarah. Do what she says. And so he had to cast out uh, Ishmael with her mother, his mother, Hagar, out into the desert. But the Lord uh, uh, blessed her and her son anyway. And uh, even though he had instructed Abraham to get rid of Ishmael, he promised uh, Hagar that he would protect Hagar and Ishmael and that he would become a great nation. And uh, so there was uh, out there in the desert a spring of water, a well of water, and they survived. And uh, they, he went into the wilderness of Paran. Now we have a map here, Zola, that shows where Paran is. Down here in the uh, Sinai. Right, in the Sinai, of south of uh, what we know as uh, Israel, south of the land of Canaan, and uh, out there toward uh, the Sinai Desert, and that was sort of the promised land for Ishmael. Abraham was up here uh, near the Dead Sea, south of what is now Jerusalem, right. in, uh, in this territory. This is Israel now, and this is south of it in the peninsula. So it became clear from that point that the main part of uh, Canaan, uh, between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River, was the inheritance of Isaac. Mm -hmm. But it would be Paran, the Sinai Desert, that would be the inheritance of Ishmael. And uh, that's the way it developed. Now, when Abraham became old, he solidified that uh, whole uh, issue. And he took uh, his sons and began dividing between them. And he told Isaac that this land is all yours. But uh, then he turned to his other sons, and he, by that time Sarah had died, and he had married Keturah, and he had other sons through Keturah. And uh, he told them that Isaac would have what we know as Israel, Canaan. Little coastline sliver here. That's right. And his other sons, Ishmael, would be to the south in Paran, and his other sons would go eastward uh, into what we know as Jordan and what used to be Moab and uh, Edom and uh, out into the Arabian desert. And so the other sons of uh, Abraham would have all this vast territory, but to Isaac would come this land and he alone would, would have it. God it was said, I, I have remembered Ishmael I have given him uh, uh, 12 princes will come from him if I remember the passage. But my covenant I make with Isaac. It was through Isaac that the promise would come. And so the land would, and the blessing, and the seed, and the messianic hope, the looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, the Christ, all of that would come through Isaac, not through the other sons of Abraham. It seems that... Uh, uh, there, there is a, an argument uh, because uh, some interpreters of Koran uh, say that the story is the other way, that the, this land, this particular land was given uh, to Ishmael and not to Isaac, but it's plain to read in Genesis 17, uh, throughout from Genesis 12 on, where God made the Abrahamic covenant. There is a definite uh, transfer of the covenant generation to generation. We came out here today into the Judean desert and <laughs> into a tent similar to that which uh, Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael uh, resided in and and, <laughs> and we're showing you some of the conditions in which they live uh, just to make that point. We'll trace the story right along as the series continues. So much of what I've been reading and studying for 20, 30 years as a Christian here in this short time has just 
come to life. It's real. It's not just something on the pages of a book now. Come with Zola and see the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For tour information, write Zola, 12268 Dallas, Texas, 75225. We understand that you are working with the... Tom visited with some sons of Ishmael, Palestinian journalists who claim they have a right to the land. We can track uh, our family uh, roots uh, in this country for hundreds of years just by knowing the names of my father and uh, my grandfather and great-great-grandfather. So actually my name uh, is combined of seven names. My name is Nasser, Abdul Jawad, Saleh, Atta, uh, Abu Sakhir, Atallah, Al Hamayan. And it is very significant because I think uh, I, I know all these uh, names uh, for my uh, grandfathers and great, great, great grandfathers. It tells that we lived here for a long time before this country was uh, proclaimed as uh, the uh, homeland for the Jew and that in history level we cannot have uh, this argument that the Israeli were here 2,000 years because even if the Jew were here 2,000 years uh, we still were here and we were living in the same country and if they just based their argument in the fact that they were here 2,000 years it means the Persians, the Ayatollahs were here six or seven hundred years and they can say that now because we are powerful we want to come back and this is our uh, homeland and this is our country or the crusaders and they can come and occupy this land. I understand that you're not biblical scholars but we have here a map that uh, was prepared by Israeli archaeologists that shows where the boundaries of the land were that was given by God at the time of Moses to the Israelis. Beginning at the southeastern border of the Dead Sea and going around Kadesh Barnea to the river of Egypt or the brook of Egypt to the Mediterranean Sea. Then coming up along the western border up the Mediterranean coastline to Mount Hor and from Mount Hor across the northern boundary to Hazar Enon, then all the way around Damascus to the Sea of Galilee, then down the Jordan River to the Dead Sea and the point of beginning. What is your thought about this map and about this promised land that the Bible says was given to Israel? I mean, this is like uh, a part of, uh, of, of their dreams, actually. And this is why it's now it's difficult for uh, the Israeli government to take any decision concerning the peace process or withdrawal from the occupied territories, because historically their people or the Israelis, they are convinced of this dreams, the holy land for uh, Israel, that God promised them uh, uh, of this land. I think this is a kind of, of uh, the, aggress uh, the aggressive side of, of the uh, uh, Israelis. They are trying to convince their people that God uh, promised them of this land. And uh, that's why they are not willing to uh, give the land back to the Palestinians or to the Arabs. I think this is uh, uh, something will not be acceptable. We are asking about the 1967 borders that Israel will withdraw from West, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem, and we will have a state there. So basically, by this solution, Israel will take 60% of the land of what was historical Palestine. But we are saying that the main issue, the essence of the conflict in the Middle East, between the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the essence of this conflict is to have a state, a homeland for the Palestinian. It's the Palestinian problems, uh, the Palestinians who are displaced in Jordan, in Syria, in, uh, in other countries, even in the United States, you have 300,000 Palestinians, that all these people can come and live in what we want to be a Palestinian state. Back to a religious question. I understand there's a celebration in the Muslim faith about Ishmael. It's called the sacrifice feast, actually, when uh, God 
uh, sacrificed uh, Ismail from being slaughtered by his father uh, Ibrahim because uh, Ibrahim saw uh, in his dream one of the nights that uh, God ordered him to uh, kill his uh, son Ismail and he was going to do the same uh, in, in the next morning uh, when God sent him a goat to sacrifice Ismail from being slaughtered by his father. And uh, uh, Ismail is known as the father of uh, the Arabs everywhere and that's why they are uh, uh, celebrating this every year. The Muslims believe in many of the biblical characters. It's just that they've rewritten their roles. Ishmael, not Isaac, was offered up by Abraham. A place called Nebi Musa, conveniently located on the West Bank, turns out to be the final resting place of Moses. In this view, Moses did make it across the Jordan River to the Promised Land after all. And what they say that the Bible is a fairy tale. In other words, what they're saying. Avi Lipkin, former press office official in the Israeli government. It's a fairy tale. Uh, my answer to that would be uh, a simple one. I would th I would say, you know, in Hebron there's the tomb of the patriarchs. And buried there is not Ishmael. Buried there is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes. So what happened to Ishmael? Another point I think is very important from a, a theological point of view is that the Testament, the Old Testament, our Bible, was written, some say it was handed down in Sinai around the year 1500 BC. Uh, there are others uh, of the Wellhausen school who say that it was more or less put together during the time of David. Uh, but the idea is that it was written at least a thousand years before the common era, or uh, as the Christians call it, uh, before Christ. Um, the New Testament was written around the first, second centuries yeah. AD, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the Quran appears 1700 years after the Old Testament, uh, 500 years, 600 years after the New Testament, and all of a sudden they say, well, you know, we take what, what is good for our religion from the New Testament, and, and, and it replaces the New and Old Testaments, which don't exist anymore, and which were all falsifications anyway. Certainly the concept... David Dolan, author of The Holy War for the Promised Land, has studied the Quran extensively. Muhammad was a warrior, and um, his campaigns, his military campaigns against the Jews and others are recorded in the Quran. And Allah, the name of the supreme being in the Quran, Allah urges his followers to engage in jihad or holy war against especially the infidels who are said to be the Christians and the Jews. That being the case, um, a Muslim today can find many scriptural admonitions in their, in their holy book to engage in jihad, in holy war. That doesn't mean by any means that all Muslims are doing that or that that's the only view. There is a, a more moderate way of looking at the Quran and uh, it has its school of, of uh, followers. But uh, certainly the average Palestinian, and I've gone out and spent many hours in the territories talking with them, and I think this is also true in Jordan. It's, it's obviously true in Jordan because the Islamic fundamentalists hold almost half the seats in the parliament there. They're very strong in Egypt. They, of course, control Iran. Um, they have their people in Lebanon, etc. They are adamant that the Quran be read in this way. Jihad, holy struggle, must be waged against the infidels. And therefore, a Jewish state in the midst of the Muslim world is a, is a tumor, as Khomeini said to them. It's a cancerous tumor, which must be removed. That's trouble. That doesn't mean that these groups can't be suppressed by another view. And in Egypt, we see where a pro-Western regime basically keeps these groups under the thumb. Yeah. But Israel's problem is knowing when this will end, or if it will end. Um, will these people eventually come to power again in Egypt? Uh, Iran is, a, is a, an example of a country that had a basically pro-Western, pro-Israel tilt, more or less, during the days of the Shah, and then Khomeini came to power and it turned into a fundamentalist Islamic state. Saddam of Iraq is another example of a person who was basically secular in his outlook, then suddenly got religion, yeah. or so he said. Mm -hmm. And this can happen anywhere. So um, the Israelis look next door to Jordan and say, will King Hussein be in power in two years? Or where, will these fundamentalists who are growing in power, will they take over? Nobody knows. So that is another reason why signing treaties, peace treaties, 
is problematic for Israel because uh, these are not democracies that they're dealing with and who knows what the situation will be in a year or two. We are dealing today with a new Cold War uh, which is developing and uh, it involves the takeover of Europe by Muslim uh, demographic invasion. It involves the takeover of the United States as we see today by the, I don't want to say the oil corporations today are doing what the Arabs told them to, but the, the oil corporations are doing the dealing for the Muslims and uh, what they're not doing with demography, they're doing with money. So your uh, concept of things is Islam is uh, uh, just uh, doing a big expansion, repeating the conquests of former times. Uh, I'd like to make two points. I feel Israel is a kind of a litmus test, a litmus paper. Uh, there are people who believe in God, there are people who do not believe in God. Uh, there's always the argument about, you know, is Jerusalem holy? And I think that the fact that the Christians, the Muslims, and the Jews believe in Jerusalem, that it's the, the one place, you know, if you studied physics and you have vectors, when you have three vectors crossing at one point, it means something's happening there. And the same thing I think applies today. Um, the Jews and the Christians believe in the coming of Messiah. The Muslims also talk about the coming of Messiah, though they're not sure who it's going to be also. Um, the Christians say that the Messiah came, left, and will return. The Jews say, no, it wasn't this gentleman, it was another gentleman. Mm. Uh, but obviously the Christians and the Jews agree that when the Messiah comes, everybody will recognize him. Uh, the difference between the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims, on the other hand, though, is that uh, the Jews are fighting for survival. The Christians who really believe in their religion correctly believe in the survival of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Because if you touch the Jews, you touch Jesus. Mm -hmm. You go against God. Uh, the Muslims say the exact opposite, that the final battle will be between the Muslims and the Jews. Mm -hmm and those who go with the Jews. It might help to understand uh, this complex controversy over the land to uh, give a definition to the term Palestinian, which is uh, not, uh, <laughs> nobody agrees what it means, and, and for good reason. It's a, uh, it's a time, it's a, la a name formed in time when Israel was called Palestine by the Romans. That is way back at uh, uh, 135 A.D. or so, all the way up until the Jews returned and gave out a declaration of independence which called it Israel. Anybody living in the land in that time was called a Palestinian. When uh, uh, people said uh, the Palestinian farmers get good results in the desert in the 19th century, gosh, some were Turks, some were Arabs, some were Jews. Uh, they were Palestinians. Uh, the, you're going to see on our program with the Jerusalem Post that Jewish newspaper used to be called the Palestinian Post, and it still was a Jewish newspaper. Uh, the definition of Palestine really is simply people found in Israel when it was called Palestine. That's all. Uh, that's what uh, Palestinians were. There is a Palestinian homeland, and it's Jordan. That's two-thirds Palestinian, if there are an indigenous Palestinian people. That's a suspicious... Uh, uh, assumption too because there's no Palestinian language. Uh, they've made a flag recently but there never was historically a Palestinian flag, Palestinian stamps or currency or, or a government any, in any way distinguishable let's say from uh, Jordan which is uh, uh, 
as I say, two out of three people there are uh, Palestinian, are called Palestinian, some are Bedouins. Um, it, it's, it's too hard a distinction to make, and, and it's being made uh, unfairly. Uh, there are claims that the Palestinians go back in history a long time. There was never a Palestinian culture in Palestine. There were just people migrating under the Turkish Empire. There were, there, there were nomads going between Jordan and the Mediterranean. Eventually, when Israel was in the land, some of those were caught on the land when the Declaration of Independence was made. They call themselves Palestinians, and indeed they're Palestinians in a sense, but that doesn't mean their culture goes back or has any roots in that land. Uh, the land itself was promised to Abraham's seed, and that's the end of that through Isaac, through Jacob, and et cetera. You know, I wrote this in the Dallas Morning News as a guest columnist, and I had an answer from somebody on the other side of the argument who said, uh, I happen to write, it's through the Abrahamic covenant. God made a promise to Abraham. He said, yes, yes, but Abraham's son Ishmael got the promise. No, Scripture goes on and says, Isaac, not Ishmael, Jacob, not Esau. Uh, that's very clear. Uh, the book we'll offer tonight uh, makes that extremely clear. Uh, well, Israel's Right to the Land is the name of the book. We've offered it for many years. I think it's a fine study. I would rewrite a book like this and put my own thoughts to it if I could do it any better. But this is a wonderful book, and I want you to have it. Uh, that and uh, <laughs> this thing has gotten so popular. Our, our little bumper sticker, Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem. I think that's it's kind of, uh, it's neutral, it's a good thought, and it's scripture, of course, it's Psalm 122.6. They shall prosper, uh, it says, those who, who obey that uh, pleasant commandment. And we'll include a map of Israel complete with the series so that you can follow the action. We have a wonderful uh, uh, map in English of all of the Israel territories in, marked with the West Bank and so on, so you can follow the logic of what we're doing. All of this taken together, $10. Okay, we're not giving expensive offers here. Send $10 dollars and call it the divine right package okay divine right package and we'll know you mean the book the sticker and the map and sha'alu shalom yerushalayim pray for the peace of jerusalem